so when I decided to launch a distillery, I looked at almost all the smaller craft distilleries, and even they were doing the same thing. They had their whiskey, they had their vodka, and they had their gin. Maybe they'd release like a you know a flavored liqueur or something like that for you know wintertime seasonal. But they all kind of adhere to the same format, the same pattern. And I like whiskey, I like vodka, but it wasn't that interesting to me because it wasn't as hands-on. When you're making a whiskey, you're kind of at the whims of a barrel. When you're making vodka, you're just making something as neutral as possible. But when it comes to gin, you really are crafting something unique. And even if I gave you the recipe, and I'm happy to give you the recipe of, of what goes into any of my gins, the format of your still, uh, the way you charge it, the way you, the temperature you run it at, the geometry of your still, all those things are going to impact the flavor of the final spirit. So everybody is going to would, would come out with a completely different gin even taking the same recipe. So that's part of the craft of it is learning your still and what it can do and how to maximize and adjust the flavors within uh, that one piece of equipment. The modular series has been absolutely fascinating and kind of my, my favorite series. For the exact reason I kind of mentioned before, it's like everybody's kind of pulling from these same botanicals and kind of creating the same gins over and over again. But when you start to really focus on the cuisine and literally the terroir of these different regions, uh, you can develop something incredibly interesting. So, for example, uh, H&D, our Japanese-inspired gin, H&D is the airport code for Haneda, Japan. Uh, you know, we were able to use green tea, uh, black sesame seed, shisho leaf. Uh, Szechuan peppercorns, things that aren't typically found in gin. Uh, our Spanish gin, SVQ, for the Seville or uh, area code, SVQ. Uh, we use Seville orange peel. We use sea kelp, rosemary, thyme, uh, a bit of oregano, uh, you know, because I really want to make a savory, unctuous gin that kind of reminds you of the sea and would, uh, would pair very well with, with tapas and small bites. And then for our CPT, our Cape Town South African gin, that was by far the most interesting to me because I think I've utilized botanicals that really nobody has. I mean, maybe somebody in South Africa, uh, but we use Mbukalaba root, which is from uh, the South African geranium plant. We use Cape aloe, Cape gooseberries, buchu leaf, uh, which is a common, commonly used as a tea in South Africa, immortelle flowers, which have this incredible aroma of somewhere between chicken stock and tarragon. It's fantastic. So like finding and sourcing all these unique botanicals has been great for me as just a person that's naturally curious about uh, what's growing in the world, uh, but also informs gins in a way that, again, I don't think anybody's ever really attempted. It's been pretty interesting. So, yeah, for all those, so like the yuzu I utilized in our Japanese inspired gin, I had to source that from a small spice company in Canada. Uh, a couple, uh, a couple spices I've had to import directly from Europe. Uh, they haven't been necessarily. It's less of like. Is it easier enough to find? It's actually what's approved by the U.S. government. We have a list called GRAS, which is generally recommended as safe ingredients. And so it basically it has to be on that list in order for us to be able to use it. For the South African gin, I would have loved to have used uh, Feinbos, uh, but it hasn't really been utilized in food or beverage in the United States, and so it's not recognized as safe to use, even though it probably is. Uh, so in that respect, it's more like, what can I get my hands on? And so, especially with the South African gin, I was like, okay, I can get these seven botanicals, bring them in-house, you know, start to smell them, start to explore them, maybe do a, a test uh, run of each individual botanical to kind of see how they result, and then mentally put it all together to think, okay, buchu leaf is fantastic, let's back that up with a bit of uh, eucalyptus, uh, which, you know, kind of brings in that fine most kind of aroma, um, and then round it out with, you know, these geranium and um, you know, floral notes as well. I think when designing each gin, it's been a little bit different. Like our flagship gin, I intentionally set out to create a gin that utilizes zero uh, citrus peel. Thinking about a gin and tonic, I was like, you're going to add citrus to the beverage already. So I wanted to create a complex spirit that utilized zero citrus. Now, I do use sumac and lemongrass in that gin. So that does provide some lemon in and citronella. So there is a lemony note to it that's kind of like uh, citrus adjacent, I guess. So in that respect, I kind of had a theoretical idea of what I want the gin to be. For the Spanish gin, same idea. I was like, okay, I want to make a very savory gin. How can I create that? So I was like, okay, you know, rosemary, thyme, oregano, and then sea kelp was kind of the one flavor that really unlocked that nice umami and kind of briny note that kind of brought it all together. 
So I thought more about the botanicals that I wanted in order to make that spirit. For the, uh, for the CPT gin, it was kind of the opposite. It's like, what botanical, botanicals can I get? And then what can I make from it as a result? So it kind of depends. You know, it's, um, it's a challenge both ways. I can't say I adhere to one plan or the other. It's just kind of, you know, kind of the outline of what I want the gin to represent. And then how do I accomplish that?